I'm going to ask you to take your Bibles and turn to 2 Samuel this morning. Before I begin this morning's service, I'm going to ask you if you would to join me in prayer. I want to give you something specific. I know there are a lot of churches today. Some of you may have seen on social media my wife put a post of yesterday. Her little cousin, who is four years old, was not feeling well this week. And uh, their family's world is turned upside down. Uh, it went from what they thought was possible leukemia to multiple tumors in her stomach and on her vital organs at four years old. She has been going to extensive treatment at UNC, a hospital of testing this uh, this weekend, and the family, as you can only imagine, is really struggling. And so I want us to pray if we could for uh, the little baby's name is Georgia Mayweather. The parents are Abby and Tyler Way. They're very young parents. Uh, as I said, Georgia May is four years old and has been prodded in post war this weekend, and probably most of us will have in our life. And so we do know that there are multiple tumors in her body, and uh, the possibility of leukemia also is being tested and looking into right now. So if you would join me as we go to the God that heals and pray for this family. Father, sometimes we don't have an answer. Sometimes we don't really know how to formulate words. But God, we can find rest in each other. We've talked from multiple Wednesday nights in our Bible study about what it means to be to be friends as a church, a friendly church, a loving church, a kind church, with our brothers and sisters. To be there for them. So Lord, our our scope of, of family goes beyond these doors. Lord, we have the same father that you. And so, Lord, I have no fancy words today. I just ask that you please be with the Webb family. I ask very specifically that you would be with that little baby as she is going through so much. And Lord, you would just intervene. That's all I really know how to ask, God, is that you would do what only you... I don't know what to pray for. But I pray that you would be with this family through this time. Lord, as we study your words, today. And it is your word, it's not mine. People walk through these doors today with burdens of their own, with difficulties of their own, with challenges of their own. And I just pray that today you would be with us. Father, we know that your spirit dwells in us. And so, Lord, we pray that today you would allow us in the hardness of our hearts. And oftentimes the hardness of our fall process, the callousness of our falls, that we would be sensitive to you speaking to us today. Thank you for the worship songs that we've sung. To be able to say that when we don't understand and when our life is turned upside down, because of you it is well in us. Lord, we love you and we thank you for your Multiple, multiple blessings in our individual lives. In Jesus, your name alone we pray. Amen. One of my favorite characters, as many of you know, in the Old Testament is a man by the name of David. As I study the life of David, I see David like me. He's had a lot of feelings. I mean, David had a lot of good things that we do like to talk about as good things. We like to talk about David just killing the giant. That's pretty awesome. We love to talk about David grabbing the lion by the beard and, and slaying the bear that as he came after his sheep. That's pretty cool, too. Oftentimes, we really focus on the fact that David was a man after God's own heart, which we absolutely should because both Old and New Testament say that. But you know, one thing that we have in common with David is that David failed in his life, and we, at some point in our life, in some form or fashion, we have failed. Maybe as a father today, we look back and go, I wish I could do some things differently. Maybe as a mother, maybe as a husband or a wife, maybe maybe as a believer, maybe as just a friend, as someone in your, that you're close to in that inner circle, you, you just feel like you have failed somebody or failed at something you've tried and it just tends to weigh heavy on you. 
Today we're going to talk about the reality of failure. It's not a matter of if we fail, it's a principle that we live by as human beings and when we fail. Many of us, I think, have in common that we have regret or of, of some choice that we've made in our life. Shame and scars abide. And even though we've been forgiven by the grace of God and praise the Lord for His forgiveness, right? You know, He does forgive. But the truth is, even in our forgiveness, sometimes we still suffer from the scars of our actions. And so today what we want to do is we want to kind of understand that failure just doesn't happen. I just don't wake up one day and fail. Oftentimes failure is a process. There's a, a time in our lives in which we're set up and, and the enemy continues to bombard us. He continues to, to lay a path and we follow that path and, and it sets us up for failure. And what we need to do is not wait to the failure to turn to God and say, Lord, forgive me because I've got this heavy burden. What we need to do is if we're there, let me say that's exactly what we need to do. But we need to recognize the steps that lead to failure. And what we can do through God's word to alleviate that. This is a crazy story that we've talked about and we've, we've, we've learned from the time we were in children. It's the story of probably one of the greatest wishes of a do-over that possibly could happen. David the shepherd boy was crowned king. And man, David was in the mess of just a life of one hiccup and mess up after the next. But David, finally the kingdoms were all restored. He had a central location. The army was growing. The kingdom was growing. Things were starting to just get good again. And can I just throw this out? There's not really part of my message today. But can I tell you today that when, when things are going good, oftentimes that's when we take our eyes off of God. And that's one of the first steps of failure. You were just talking about how Peter stepped out of the boat into the water. And he took his eyes off God and he focused on the waves around him. You know, we do that sometimes when troubles come, but we also do that sometimes when things are going really well. I mean, things are going great in our lives, and then we've just come through a valley. We've just come through the storm, and things are starting to work out. The bills are getting paid, and, and the doctor's visits go well. And, 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 you know, we're just in a good place. And, and oftentimes, let's be honest, we take our eyes off God during that time, too. And David was at a place where the kingdom was finally at somewhat peace. Thank you, Lord. I'm going to read from chapter 11 today, and I'm going to speak on chapter 12 shortly, but I'm just going to read three verses for time's sake. First, I'm going to read verses 1 and 2 of chapter 11, and I'm going to read verse 27 of 1 Samuel chapter 11. It says, In the spring of the year, when kings normally go out to war, David sent Joab and the Israelite army to fight the Ammonites. They destroyed the Ammonite army and laid siege to the city of Rabbah. However, David stayed behind in Jerusalem. Late one afternoon, after his midday rest, David got out of his bed and was walking on the roof of the palace. As he looked out over the city, he noticed a woman of unusual beauty taken aback. So I want us to look at that first verse, because oftentimes when we preach on this particular passage, we don't focus on the first verse, we jump to the last. First verse says, in the spring of the year when kings normally go to war, David sent someone else to do his job. Verse 27, then we'll put it all together. When the period of mourning was over, David sent for her and brought her to the palace, and she became one of his wives, and she gave birth to a son. I love the New Living Translation. Tradition, it says, but the Lord was displeased with what David had done. Man, what a statement. David was at peace and things were going well when the David who was the mighty man of valor, the David, the one who the, 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 the psalm was sung, Saul has killed his thousands. But let me tell you something, David is a man who likes to fight. He's killed his tens of thousands. He was a man known to do battle. He was a man known to go to war. But this time when everybody else was going to war, David decided to stay home and send someone else to do his job. 
So I want to jump right into this today, and I want you to pay careful attention to these simple steps that every one of us, if we review our lives, in the times in our lives in which we have suffered the consequences of failure, these steps will probably bring true. The first thing I want you to see in the steps of failure is David was not doing what he alone should have been doing. It says that the kings normally go to war. Now, why is that the case? Why is it the springtime? I'll tell you back then they had a rule of thumb. You can do that, you, you, not just biblical history, but in history, period. Oftentimes, kings would go to war during the springtime because there were certain seasons that were rainy. There were certain seasons which they needed the men to farm the land. There were certain seasons where they needed to store up grain for the other months. So in the springtime was the most opportune time to fight. Now, isn't that crazy? Isn't it crazy that they're courteous enough to wait to fight in the springtime instead of going at each other in the wintertime? And so it was a common practice. If you read any of the Old Testament, you'll see this is a common practice through there. As a matter of fact, you'll often see as you study the Old Testament, they would be at war and then stop fighting to go back home and then resume fighting when it was time for battle. So this was not something that just kind of sprung forth. This is something that had been planned for some time. And David did not go. The point is simple. David was at home. He knew he shouldn't have been there, but he stayed there anyway. There are times in our life where we're at a place where we know we don't belong. I'm not talking about a location. I'm talking about a place in our life. I mean, if we could just be honest, maybe we're going to church, but, but we're not really doing anything with this on our life. Maybe it's been a while since we've prayed. Maybe, maybe we're at a place in our life where we've had it out with another person or another uh, a brother, another sister. We've had it out, and, and instead of dealing with it and resolving the issue, we've let it fester, and we've created signs. See, we're not foolish people. I believe there's a lot of very smart people in this church. So when we're in a place that we know we shouldn't be, then it's not something that we're not aware of. We're aware. Many of us have been at points in our lives where we knew. When we knew without a question that this is not where God is. David was where he should not have. Excuse me, David was doing what he should not have been doing. You've seen people that, you know, got yard work that needs to be done. You know what needs to be done. Some of you are really struggling right now because I'm speaking to you after all this rain, right? You let your dog out to get to the bathroom, you lose them, you can't find them, you have to go and send people out to look at the dog. Is so high. You know you need to do it, and you. So, so I, I'm not. I'm not trying to despiritualize this, but it's, it's that same principle. You know it needs to be done, but you're just not going to do it. Many of us find ourselves in a spiritual uh, despair, a spiritual valley, and we know it's not right. We know we we don't have any joy. We know we're not pleasing God, but yet we're not doing anything. See, the first step to failure in David's life was David was not doing what he knew he should have been doing. Can I ask you a question? Are there things in your life right now that you should be doing? And if the answer is yes, can I follow up with a second question? Why are you not doing The second thing I want you to see is David's mind was focused on what it should not have been focused on. Andrew, when you were speaking, you were talking about how he gazed in Christ's eyes. And as long as he was focused on Christ, he was on the water. When he took his eyes off Christ and put it on the situation, he was in the water. David, for years, had his eyes focused on the Lord. In the cave, he had his eyes focused on the Lord. When he had a chance to kill his enemy, he said, I will not touch the Lord's anointed king. He had his eyes focused on the Lord. Now we see him on the roof of the palace and he's got his eyes focused on something he knew they should not have been focused on. Listen to me, David was a man after God's own heart. He knew what he was doing was wrong. Now why was he on the roof many people ask? Can I tell you that's a common practice? That's a common practice today. One of the first missionary trips I went on was a very high, um, high humidity place. It was hot and, and humid. And, and I remember one of the things we did in the evening time in this this very run-down area, so we would go on the roof, literally go on the roof and sit. 
and, and, and just communicate because it was cool, there was no air conditioning and so forth in there. So the practice of living or sleeping or, or standing on the roof was not unusual in and of itself. The practice of David looking at a woman taking a bath and staying focused on her, that is where he David was not doing what he should have been doing. He knew that, but he didn't do anything about it. David was focusing on what he should not have been focusing on. He knew that, but again, he didn't do anything about it. How many times have we let anger, jealousy, bitterness ruin our lives? Because we're so focused on it. You've heard me preach this before. When you forgive other people, God didn't tell us to forgive and love our enemies to make them better. He did that so we can become better. So we can be free from the bondage that oppresses each and every one of us when we allow bitterness and things that have haunted and hurt us to reside in our lives and keep us from experiencing the joy that God offers us. He did it for our sake. And there's sometimes we look and we gaze and we focus on things we should not be gazed and focused on. And listen, guys, I'm telling you, David walked on the roof and when he did, I don't know if heard people say that David knew she was going to be out there. I heard people say that it was a surprise. It doesn't matter if he knew she was going to be out there or if it was a surprise. So the indication here in the Hebrew is that David caught her eye or she caught David's eye and then he stopped and he gave his attention. That's what that means. That literally means that he gave his attention to her. Listen, there are things we're going to see. There are things that we're going to participate in that we can't help. You see a billboard. You see something on a, on a TV that flashes in front of you. You can't help seeing those things. It's when we gaze. It's when we focus and give our attention on things that will rob us of our joy. It becomes, listen, watch. Look at the simple act. They said, I know I'm not where I need to be, but that's okay. I know I shouldn't be focused on this, but that's okay. There are two warning signs. And David failed to recognize both of those warning signs. The Bible says in verse 3 that he sent. And I'll talk about that and I'm jumping ahead of myself. Let me just say this. There are certain things that will attack your mind. There were certain things that will destroy your mind. There were certain things that will destroy your joy. We focus on something. We know that God is displeased with. It will do damage to you. How many of us today are focused on something we should be focused on? Focused on somebody that's hurt us in the past terribly. Or focused on someone that we really don't care for, but they seem to get all the blessings and we get all the hard knocks. And I start to go a little deeper into our Christian walk. How many of us focus on maybe some type of habit or some type of show or something like that that we know completely dishonors God? Can I tell you something? Can I tell all my guy friends something today? You cannot focus on pornography at any level. It did not affect your mind. We don't have to talk about that in church because you know what? That's just not what we do. But yes, that is what we need to do. We need to talk about things that are robbing us of our joy. David was he was not where he supposed he was should have been, and he knew that. He was focusing on things he should not have focused on, and he knew that. Let me just say this by way of transition of what we focus on. If we're not careful, careful we will soon act. Number three. David acted in a way that he should not have acted. The Bible says in verse 3 that David sent for her, or he inquired of Bathsheba and brought her to him. When we are not where we should be, when our mind is not focused on what it should focus on, then it is inevitable that we will certainly act on that which we should not act. You understand what I'm saying here? Don't make this harder than it is, and I don't want to make it harder than it is. When we know that we're not in a place that we should be, when our spirit is struggling, when we are just completely at the point of being overcome, that is a warning sign that we're on the road to failure. 
When we begin to focus on things that we know we shouldn't focus on, instead of focusing on the goodness of God, instead of focusing on how God can help me through this, we're focusing on all the negative things around us, all the, the, the sinful things around us. That is a definitive sign of failure. Because these two steps will lead us to the third step, and that is to act on it. You know what? I've never said an ugly word that wasn't first filtered through my mind. I never told a lie that first wasn't filtered through my mind. I never participated in any action that wasn't first filtered through my mind. And if we can learn to catch it here before it comes out here, it would save us a lot of damage. David knew he wasn't where he should be. David knew that he should not have been focusing on that. And number three, David knew he should not have acted on those things. Can I tell you why? I told you these are the steps. Can I tell you why we often make these choices? Number two, the mistakes we often make on the road to failure. Number one, first, first thing, excuse me, is David thought he could get away. He did. He thought he could get away, get away with it. We can look at verses 6 through 21 here. We can break it down into different verses. I won't tonight or today because of time. But you, hey, can I tell you something? We cannot run from God. Do you understand that? That is an awesome thing. We talk about how God is there for us in the bad times. But you know what? God sees us in the simple times too. Can I read something to you? It's Psalms 139. One of my favorite verses. It's just, where can I go from your spirit? Where, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee to get away from your presence? If I go to the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in the depths, you're there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there, your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is like the light to you. You know what he said? He said, there's nowhere I can go. There's no place that I can be that God's not aware. Whether it's Adam and Eve in the garden, hiding behind some bushes, or whether it's me on a stage on Sunday morning at Parkwood Baptist Church, you and I cannot evade the presence of an almighty God. Are you listening to me this morning? Are you playing? Are you with me? Do you understand the principle here today that we cannot escape the presence of God? That enough should put such fear in us that it changes the way we live. I have never gotten away with one sin in my entire life. Let me hurry along. Number one mistake is that David thought he could get away with. We cannot get away with anything. There is nothing that we do that God's not aware of. Mistake number two, David tried to hide and justify his sin. I can't hide my sin. And I think we all agree with that. I think the problem we have in today's America is we try to justify our sin. We take sin, we put another title on it, and we say it's okay when that's absolutely not the case. You understand that? That's why the sanctity of marriage is being challenged. That's why the lives of the unborn babies are being challenged. Because we put another title on it and we feel better about it. Can I tell you something? The cup can be gold encrusted with jewels. But if it's poison on the inside, you'll die just the same. And we have painted sin up to make it look pleasing and justifiable. But the residual effect of the sin is still the same. As it's always been. I love this when I study this in verse number 27 that David said, I'm going to marry her. You know what? Everybody in the kingdom thought David was a pretty good guy. You realize that? Because they saw this, this, this warrior, Uriah, go to battle and fight for his country, and they saw that sheep were pregnant, and in their mind they were thinking it's got to be Uriah's baby, and the king, and the goodness, and the kindness of his heart, he's going to take this widowed woman in, and he's going to let her live in the palace and raise Uriah's son like his own. He fooled everybody but it. Who? God. I can fool everybody some of the time, but God, none of the time. And when I try to justify sin and make excuses for it, that just prolongs the opportunity for my repentance. Hey, guys, listen to me. Let's just make this as elementary as we possibly can. We all make choices that we regret. We all wish that we could have a mulligan or a do-over. There's times in my life I wish I could go back and change right now, but I can't. So what I need to do is learn from those times and mark 
the beginning of the failure process. Okay, God, I'm not where I should be, so I'm going to change that. Okay, God, I'm focusing on what I should not focus on. I'm going to change that by your grace. Okay, God, I don't want to act this way because I know that this will cause damaging results. God, so therefore, I'm not going to do it. Why? Because, God, I cannot hide my sin from you, and there's no justifier in my actions. Somebody pulls out in front of me and I let a slew of profanities go off. I can't justify what that person pulled out for me. I have to answer for my own choices. When I try to justify, it prolongs the repentance process. Look at verse 27. Roman number three, the one thing that we must never forget. I'm almost done. When I fail, not only does it hurt me, but it hurts God. Can you think of somebody in your life right now that you don't want to disappoint? Maybe a grandchild, child, or husband, or wife, or somebody. You just say, you know what? I never want to disappoint me. Have you ever thought about how will we be disappointed? Her? Let me get these real quick. David was slow to see his sin in his own life, but he was quick to see the sin. Nathan came to him, one of the greatest stories, one of the great, coolest stories in the Old Testament. Nathan came to him and he said, i got to tell you the story. David said, all right, I'm all ears. Nathan began to tell the story about a man about a sheep. He loved that sheep, and that sheep was like a child because he had no children. Somebody came and took that sheep and cut it up and put it on the table and ate it. They said, you've got to be kidding me. I cannot believe that happened. You fire that man. We're going to take that man's life. We're going to take his family. We're going to put him in prison. We're going to kill him. We're going to turn his life upside down. And they said, okay, I don't have to look very far because you're the man. Isn't it awesome how David was ready to rip that man up, tear him up in little bitty pieces, and throw him into the field until he found out it was himself? Now, this is where it gets really scary, so hold on because we're, we're closing the door. <laughs> It's so easy for me to see sin in other people's lives. Because that doesn't hurt. Me. But when I see sin in my own life, it hurts to get rid of it. Immediately in chapter 12, David repented. Psalms 51 is the Psalms of repentance. David the prophet said, God has forgiven you. We love that story. This is what we, I'm going to teach you today so you'll never forget. He said, God's forgiven you. Nevertheless, your family will suffer because of it. <coughs> Guys, please listen to me. I don't think this is all. I never heard it growing up, and I wish I knew. I wish I knew. When we fail, God is a gracious God who will forgive us if we repent. Just because we repent and God forgives us doesn't mean that there will not be any consequences because of our actions. We don't like this. We don't want to teach this. Very few praise and worship songs are written about this. David repented of his sins in first, Second Samuel 12, verse 13. In Psalms 51, one of the greatest psalms of repentance ever written was David's psalm of repentance. That even though he repented, and even though God forgave him, he still suffered consequences of sin. I don't like this point. I'll be the first to tell you. A man who commits a crime may be forgiven, but he still may go to jail. A murderer may come to repentance and understand that the grace of God is offered, but that is a relieving of the sins. There have been choices and times in my life where I have failed and God has forgiven me, but His just hand of punishment is still open. His kingdom suffered. His new wife, Bathsheba, suffered. His children fell apart. Preacher, what in the world do I do? I hate when preachers tell you what's wrong and not tell you what to do, so I'm going to tell you what to do when we go home. How do I keep from failing? This may sound outlandish. This may even sound crazy. But the very foundation, can I ask you to please keep God in your life every day? Read His Word every day. Oh, that's 
crazy. I know it sounds crazy. We got TV and we got DVR that we can record everything we want to watch. And we watch it when we get home. And you know, a lot of years ago, we talked about how good the nation was before the nation turned upside down. They didn't have all the luxuries, but what they had oftentimes was an oil lamp. What they had oftentimes was a fireplace. And they, even though they didn't have a lot of books in there, even though they didn't have encyclopedias, which some may not even know what that is today, you know what they had? Most towns had a Bible. And they would sit around and read that Bible. And families were better for it. Communities were better for it. Schools were better for it. Our nation was better for it. The only difference, we got more luxuries than we've ever had before. The only difference is this was the focal point instead of everything else. The first thing I want to tell you is elementary. But have a relationship with God's Word. The second thing, and I don't mean to be repetitive, but not only read it, but meditate on it. Joshua 1 8 says, study this book of instruction continually. Meditate on it day and night so that you will be able to do all that is written in it. Only then will you prosper and succeed. You know what he says? He says, don't just read it, but I want you to apply it to your life. I want you to lay in bed at night, and I want you to think about what it means to pray for your enemy. As crazy as that is, understand that God did that. I want you to understand the life of David, a man after God's own heart. He filled with God, restored him. I want you to understand what the Word of God says. Don't just read it. I want you to meditate it. And then the third thing, be accountable to somebody. I said this, and I'll say this to you young people who I, I'm, I'm, Guys, I'm thankful. I, you guys have a than I do. I'm thankful that as a child of the 80s, I didn't have a cell phone. Because you guys were exposed to things that if I wanted to be exposed to it, I had to work really hard. But it's right there in the palm of your hand. You have social media where people can use it for good, but they can also use it to hurt and destroy and to attack your person, very person, to make you feel worse about yourself. You have it extremely difficult today. There is no question about it. But young guys, man, you young men, you young ladies, I just, I really desperately want to see, I'm going to speak on behalf of Mark and Ron and these guys, I really want to see some young men step up to the end of God. And I know that sounds crazy, but it's only young ladies to say, I'm going to be used by God. Nobody else is. I'm not That's like I said a lot today. I'm going to put it all together and we'll There have been times in my life where I knew I wasn't where I should be and I did nothing about it. There have been times in my life where my thought was focused, my mind was focused, my eyes were focused on things that should not have been focused on, and I did nothing about it. Because of those two steps and nothing was done, there have been times in my life the opportunity and act to say, oh, you were doing anything thing, presented itself, and I did nothing about it. So come to and even though God forgives me for my sin, and even though God will forgive you for our sin, you for your sin, we must understand that sin has consequences. And you say, I don't like that. That scares me good. It scares me too. And my hope and my prayer is that will shake all of us at our very foundation. So when the first step comes and we know we're in a place we shouldn't be, we make a decisive choice. Get out of the right get in there. Because my actions have consequences. Grace is sufficient. Mercy is the wrong serve. But sin always has consequences. David was a man who failed. He was a man after God's own heart, but he was a man who failed miserably. That I believe if we all get in the mind up to David, if you could do it all over with again, would you do it? He'd probably smack us across the face and say, Are you kidding me? Yes, I would do it. How dare you ask me that question? I would. Love to have a do over. I would love not to disappoint and hurt God because even though I'm with you, even though I'm a man after his own heart, I've hurt him and those are guys. There are steps to failure. It doesn't just happen. As you go down these steps, mark these steps, make a decision in the middle of those steps. Just get away. You get out. <coughs> don't let it ruin you. Don't let it hurt you. Don't let it destroy what God has given you. Would you bow your heads? Father, in the name of Jesus. What a great group of men went on. Lord, my prayer today, the message today is simply, I just love my family. I don't want any of us, not me, not me, of us. I don't want any of us to be this, the recipient for the, of the consequences of sin. Lord, I want every man, every woman, every young man, every young woman. I want every one of us to recognize when we're in a place we shouldn't be. I want it to scare us. I want us to, 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 to cause to just that, 
the shocking reality of this is not where I need to be and you make a change. Lord, when we're focused on things that we should not be focused on, I want it to shock us, Lord, so that we just step away and say, I've got to get my mind off it. So that when the opportunity to act comes up, Lord, we're so far removed from that, we're not even there. But the reality is we all have faith. We've all been where we should have been. Focused on what we should have focused on. And participated in what we should have participated in. We've all done that, Lord Jesus. And so today, what do we do? Well, the most important thing is to seek to, to seek you to ask for forgiveness. The process of repentance is not just being sorry for the sin, but to say, Lord, by your strength, I don't want to ever participate in it again. Huh, sounds crazy. I know. Lord, the reason I'm doing that is not to put a, a big S on everybody's chest for Superman or Superwoman. I don't want any of my family to hurt. I don't want to see them suffer. I don't want to see them <sighs> inherit the consequences of that choice. So God on the road to life, please give us wisdom to recognize the road to failure. And to be wise enough to step off of it. To count the cost. Or to focus on you. Thank you for the day. Thank you for your wonderful goodness. Thank you for everyone that's here today. In Jesus, your name alone. Amen. God bless you. Thank